This is episode 175 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Human Colon Organoids, with Dr. Henna Farin. Hey everyone, this is Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. And we have some exciting news. Stem Cell Technologies is launching a new sister podcast to the Stem Cell Podcast, the Immunology Podcast will be a brand new podcast covering the latest advances in immunology, including topics such as adaptive and innate immunity, immune regulation, autoimmunity, immunotherapy, and infectious disease research. It's looking for two great hosts. If you're an immunology researcher with a demonstrated passion for communicating cutting-edge research, then we want to hear from you. If you're interested in applying or learning more about this opportunity, visit stemcellpodcast.com slash immunology podcast. Today, we have Dr. Henner Farin from the Jörg Speyer House Institute for Tumor Biology and Experimental Therapy in Germany. He's on the podcast to talk about his research on 3D organoid models for colon cancer biology. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news coming right up. But first, are you genome editing human intestinal organoids? Or maybe you're looking to incorporate this technique and technology to better develop human disease models. Check out stem cells validated and easy to follow protocol for performing high efficiency CRISPR genome editing of human intestinal organoids. Visit www.stemcell.com slash CRISPR dash intestinal organoids to learn more. We're going to stick with the endoderm theme and focus on a pancreas paper, immune evasive human islet like organoids ameliorate diabetes. We're talking about diabetes and this is a, a hot topic in the stem cell field. It seems like every other episode we're talking about a new differentiation protocol to make human islet cells and pancreatic beta cells that could secrete insulin to lower uh, blood glucose and ultimately ameliorate and alleviate diabetes. Cool thing about this article, which is coming from the lab of Ron Evans down there at the Salk Institute in sunny San Diego. Cool thing about this article is it's creating a functional human islet like organoid or HELO that they call it um, that can actually be quite advanced in terms of being able to secrete the adequate amount of insulin. But the other really critical thing is that this HELO, this human islet-like organoid, has an innate immune evasive property. Um, what they're able to do is to essentially create these functional HELOs, mature them using WINT4. Uh, WINT is going to be a theme of this episode. It's going to come up again in a few uh, down the road in a few minutes. So they're using WINT4 to mature these HELOs. They're demonstrating that after you transplant them into mice, they retain this functional maturity. But the the amazing thing, and I think the reason why this is going to be this is in nature, is that when you actually hyperactivate PDL one, this uh, pretty famous immune modulator, PDL one blockers are all the rage right now, right? And when you activate PDL one, you're actually getting a suppression of the immune system. And this is really the key. This is the key to allowing these helos, these islet-like organoids, to last long-term in these humanized and mouse models with active immune systems. That's another key here. So these are not immunosuppressed mice. They're the real deal. It's uh, it's when you're hyperactivating this PDL one either using a genetic approach or actually um, using interferon gamma. That's the other approach, the natural approach to actually hyperactivate PD-01. When you're hyperactivating PD-01, these things are able to evade the immune system, survive for a couple months plus in, in real mice. And that's the, the translational component here, is because if you're not using any sort of genetic manipulation at all, if you're just able to treat these cells with interferon gamma and naturally hyperactivate pd one then there's a very obvious clinical uh, potential here. One thought is you can mass produce these helos, you can transplant them into people potentially, and then 
in doing so, you you wouldn't necessarily have to have any sort of advanced um, immunosuppression. You would just activate PDL1 through an overactivation, a stimulation of interferon gamma, and you're off. These helos will be able to survive long term, maybe for for months on end. I mean, of course, it's a, it's a pipe dream. It's a bit of a dream. Uh, this is all coming from this particular study, which is all in in vivo mouse model, right? And of course, when you translate to humans, you got to make sure that these same observations hold up. But that's why this paper is in nature, is because this is a it's a natural approach to actually making these insulin secreting organoids uh, last long term in an in vivo setting. Um, really neat stuff. And, you know, it is in nature for a reason. Yes, this immune obstacle has been there from the start. I remember the, you know, one of the first efforts was like, we'll just encase them and it was found that, you know, even encasing these things, I think Biocyte had those trials and they were always doing it suspiciously in these immunocompromised mice. And that was a question at the meeting. It says, why are you still using immunocompromised mice when these like packets are immune privileged? And that's because even then you got like fibrosis. So there's a lot of elements there to, to, to getting the cells in. Um, and I think this uh, is a major stride. Like you said, it's why it got in nature. I, I wonder in terms of the endogenous activation um, using interferon gamma. I wonder what the term is. I'm sure they have it somewhere in the paper. I don't know if you know, but like how long do they uh, upregulate that endogenous PDL1? How long can they evade the immune system with this, uh, you know, non-integrative approach? I, I guess we'll have to wait and see in the humans, but you know, we're not quite there. Like you said, it's a pipe dream, but it's coming closer to reality with studies like these. Yeah. Um, so, you know, figure four of the paper actually kind of detailed their approach for how they treated these helos with interferon gamma. It was multiple days um, for, for a few days on end. Uh, it wasn't a constant interferon gamma treatment. It was, you know, kind of a like a pulse treatment, it seems like. But I think you, you touched on a really good point there. This is uh, if you want to translate this into humans, you got to see how long these things actually can survive. In the paper, they limited their studies to up to three months. OK, hey. um, if they're if this is going to be a treatment, if this is going to be a therapy, are you going to have to constantly reproduce and retransplant these helos or is it just a one shot deal? I don't think it's going to be a one shot deal, but hey, you know, that's um that's something that we'll have to investigate in, in clinical trials. Yeah, well, it's a huge unmet need, and and the state of the art just isn't doing it, right? We're getting better with all these insulin pumps and everything, but, you know, a long-lived cellular surrogate for these would be an amazing step forward for millions of people in the U.S., an ever-expanding population. And there's another huge population in America, an unmet need, um, not as serious, perhaps, as diabetes, although that's arguable. It's arthritis uh, 50 million Americans diagnosed with arthritis, and that's going to expand by 50% with all these boomers by 2040, all right? And a lot of these is osteoarthritis, uh, and there's no real effective treatment for that. You know, rheumatoid arthritis is one thing. You can do some things, but osteoarthritis, not much you can do, but relieve pain and eventually joint replacement. You know, that's the standard of care. That's not great. There is this idea uh, that has kind of taken hold, and it's shown a lot of potential, and it's real, of the microfracture surgery, which was developed in the 50s, and it's widely used, particularly among athletes today. And it's a procedure where a surgeon drills into the debrided chondral bone, into the marrow cavity, um, and then there's a hematoma that forms at the microfracture site, and when that's resorbed, it's replaced by fibrous tissues. Okay, this is like a fibrocartilage that provides some symptomatic relief, but it's not like the same as genuine articular cartilage, of course. Um, doesn't have the same uh, degree of mechanical properties. Um, but, you know, at the outset, we don't really know much about how microfracture causes these fibrocartilage in the first place um, and what the effect is on the like, resident stem cell populations and how you can manipulate this for tissue rege regeneration. Now, the, the majority of trials um, that have looked at osteoarthritis are like feasibility studies that are using MSCs, okay? Um, these are autologous MSCs, and they're derived from bone marrow adipose tissue, and that's just not sufficient. You know, we're talking about this idea, but we're not using the right cells, okay? As an alternative, a lot of groups, including uh, the groups of Michael Longacre and Charles Chan, uh, Charles Chan at uh, Stanford University, 
they have isolated and identified and characterized skeletal stem cells in both mouse and human and define their ability to self-renew and their multi-lineage con contribution. And this is key. These cells are defined by their contribution to bone, cartilage, and stroma, but not fat. Okay. But um, these same skeletal muscles, uh, skeletal stem cells, sorry, that have been identified in humans and mouse, um, they're very context specific. They come out following injury um, and they do demonstrate enhanced skeletogenic potential so they can make more skeleton, but uh, more bone. But whether they can also gen regenerate cartilage is relatively uh, unknown, it hasn't been determined. So what they did here is they kind of teased apart how these uh, skeletal stem cells play a role in cartilage, and they focused on age here, and that was the key determinant. They showed that as uh, mice age, there's a progressive loss of these skeletal stem cells, and that goes with de decreased chondrogenesis in the joints of mice, and they also show that this plays in humans as well. They also show, though, that you can expand these local skeletal stem cells. You could trigger this in the context of microfracture as well. And what they showed here that was key is that even though these microfracture activated skeletal stem cells, they, they typically formed fibrous tissues, okay? So the same thing that you see in the clinical context, it's more fibrous, it's not a great surrogate for articular cartilage, but they found, and this is why it's a nature medicine story room, they found mm -hmm. that if you augment by delivering BMP2 and a soluble VEGFR1, which is a receptor antagonist. In uh, hydrogel, they show that they could skew differentiation of these skeletal stem cells toward bona fide articular cartilage. So that's a big deal. I mean, we're not talking about curing diabetes here, obviously, but I mean, in terms of application, I think this is a very big deal because this is something that I imagine a lot of uh, surgeons that are performing microfracture, you can imagine, particularly a lot of athletes may be looking at this as a chance at renewed, genuine articular cartilage in the context of microfracture surgery, just by adding these factors that are kind of clinic ready. You know what I'm saying? So I think uh, this is like a big deal for all the osteos out there, all the athletes out there. Yeah, it's not just um, a big deal for the athletes, but like you mentioned, for the for the aging population as well. This is cool stuff coming out of Stanford from Mike Longacre, and uh, this is uh, just full disclosure here. Dr. Longacre was a, a thesis advisor, thesis committee member of mine. He's got a pretty cool office. He's actually an athlete himself, so it makes sense that he's working on a lot of these stories. You walk into his office, and you've got basketball pictures and pictures of him with Magic Johnson because he actually used to be at Michigan State as a student athlete when they won their national championship back in the day. But I digress. Um, uh, but, you know, very cool stuff from Dr. Longacre and co. Uh, this I, the first thing I actually thought about when you, we saw this paper was a parallel with an earlier paper that we talked about on the podcast, this uh, skin stretch paper that I covered a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. where you can actually stretch out the skin and hyperactivate the stem cells residing within the skin itself. So this is another instance of potentially an acute event, like a microfracture or something like that, inducing stem cell activity. So it's not just the endogenous genetic programs that are hyperactivating stem cell function, a lot of times it's a biomechanical cue. And this is, I think, another example of that. Yeah. And I guess maybe what you're alluding to there is it'd be interesting to see how these cells are kind of going wrong in a degenerative context. You know, this osteoarthritis, instead of treating it with microfracture, it is, you know, invasive. Uh, it'd be nice to see if we could target and kind of preempt this osteoarthritis, particularly in at-risk people like Longacre himself. I mean, by now, I'm sure his knees are totally <laughs> shot, but maybe some of his postdocs, he could save them from a future of pain and misery from all their, their sporting. Maybe I'll ask him next time I'm on campus, but sticking with uh, discoveries that are coming well, associated with Stanford in a way. Um, the next paper we're going to talk about is a cell stem cell paper called Intrinsic Endocardial Defects Contribute to Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome. This is actually coming from a, a, a new PI at Cincinnati Children's, Dr. Ming Xiaogu. Uh, first author is Yifei Miao. I think most of the work here was done when uh, Ming Xiao was actually in the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute uh, for the last few years. So we're talking about hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is a pretty significant congenital heart defect 
um, where the left ventricles of individuals afflicted, afflicted with HLHS uh, are significantly impacted. They're not able to pump properly, and they even with a repaired heart, as many as one in four kids still die from complications from HLHS before the age of 25, right? So in this particular study, they're doing a disease model. They're trying to develop a human heart atlas that can actually track the, the signals that endocardial cells in particular are, are sending out to adjacent cells in the context of HLHS and to figure out how these signals can actually impact the heart during pregnancy. It's been more well understood how HLHS has impacted uh, the myocardium, and there actually have been IPS studies focusing on the myocardium, but this study is focusing on the endocardium, the collection of endothelial cells that are lining the inside of the, the cardiac chambers. And they show that indeed there are a, a lot of abnormalities in these IPS-derived and uh, otherwise primary uh, endocardial cells, and these abnormalities can disrupt healthy heart formation. So if we walk through the paper, there's quite a bit of RNA sequencing and single cell RNA sequencing here. They're comparing normal fetal hearts to uh, HLHS hearts and identifying a genetic signature that might be causative of the some of the defects that you're seeing in these HLHS patients. In particular, they're able to show abnormalities in the, like I said, the endocardial populations. They're able to show that um, there are functional defects using uh, IPS ECs and also cardiomyocytes. Uh, they, the disease model also showed that the cardiomyocytes from these HLHS uh, patients had impaired proliferation and maturation. So again, a back and forth crosstalk between the myocardium and the endocardium in the context of HLHS. And they dove even deeper. They identified that fibronectin is um, a significant gene that may be implicated in the context of HLHS. And they're able to show that, again, an IPS model, multiple in vivo models, a Xenopus model. I think, again, that's that's part of the reason this is actually in cell stem cell is because you're not just doing a pure in vitro IPS study. You're identifying some uh, pathways like fibronectin pathway, and you're actually validating that in multiple other model systems. I think to get a pretty high profile paper in something like a nature or cell stem cell, you got to do that these days, right? And then finally, they show that a knockdown of another gene, ETS1, in vivo, again, in vivo, caused a reduction in fibronectin 1. And this led to a, a reduction in fibronectin in the endocardium specifically, ultimately leading to abnormal heart development in Xenopus. So it's, it's spanning the full gamut from in vitro, identifying an observation that endocardial cells may be negatively impacted in the context of HLHS. But the important thing is they brought this back and validated it using an in vivo system. And we've talked about Xenopus a little bit on the show. It's part of the reason that you know a lot of people, developmental biologists, get into stem cell biology because it's such a powerful model system, right? You can introduce a particular defect in, say, the heart for example, and see that manifest over the course of, of weeks. It's it's a powerful system. Don't forget about it. It's not all about the zebrafish. Xenopus is important too. Um, so we're looking at HLHS and answering a pretty important basic question here. Yeah, man, Xenopus, that's what got me into the game. So I'm not trying to sleep yeah. on Xenopus. I think a lot of people sh should show more respect. Recognize, people. Um, you know, it's about this uh, IPS, the heart story. You know, it's I, I remember it was like 10 years ago, more, when IPS was first making its big splash that it seemed like we ran out of heart stories. Everyone ran at the heart. It was like, for instance, like Ihor Lamishka, I remember, rest in peace, he did this uh, leopard syndrome. I mean, that jumps out at me. And there were all these yeah. kind of cardiac uh, defects, genetic that all came down the pipe with IPS. And then there was a, a bit of a latency here. And I'm wondering, it's like, no one took a look at hypoplastic left heart syndrome back then. I'm wondering, looking at this, if maybe it's because of the, the advance of the technology, right? So now we have the single cell seek and we're able to resolve some yep. things that maybe were not apparent. Maybe we were only looking at the cardiomyocytes before, you know what I mean? So it, it shows, what this shows me 
is that how you know there's this the 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 ideas and the concepts and the tech build on each other such that like recursively every decade or so we got to take another look at everything with the new technology and see see what we can learn and this is a great example of that and like you said they went soup to nuts across many different models really made a big splash in vivo with the fetal heart so yeah cell stem cell paper because they looked at the heart all different ways and the cardium and uh really t took a deep dive so respect yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, these studies are often just a reflection of the time in which they're published, right? Twelve-ish years ago, you could make iPSCs from a person with long QT syndrome show that these cells actually have a, a, a electrophysiological abnormality in a dish, and that would just get you a nature paper, mm -hmm. just the production of the iPS cardiomyocytes, right? But these days, you have to really span the full gamut. Just making the cells isn't enough anymore. You have to demonstrate in an in vivo system that your whatever pathway or mechanisms you identify in your in vitro system hold up. The other thing that I think is um, interesting here, and again, a reflection of why it's so important to have that in vivo system, it's we're talking about hypoplastic left heart, which is a structural abnormality of the developing heart. And if you're just looking at a two-dimensional context, like a two-dimensional IPS model, that's not going to tell you enough, right? Because there's so many spatial components, three-dimensional components that are only present in an in vivo context, right? I've actually run into this exact same problem in some of the, the papers that some of the studies that I've done. How can you reproduce congenital heart disease in a dish, in a two dimensional context? You have to bring it back to the in vivo system into a three dimensional context. And I'm really happy they, they did that here. Yeah, you talk about back in the days when I came up, there were paper titles in nature like Wint induces cardiogenesis in, in, in pluripotent stem cells. And that was big because it was, it was mm -hmm. showing, you know, inferences from model organisms, but showing in this new system that this is how you make, you know, cardiomyocytes or this is how you make anything. And, and it was enough just to dump something on the dish and then do some qPCR. To that point, getting back to Wint, you began with a little allusion to Wint. We're talking about Wint and 20 years ago getting you a nature paper here. After all that, you know, the mechanistic function of Wint and vis-a-vis -vis its, its receptors and downstream effectors, it's not well understood. You know, this is fundamentally Wint's heterodimerized frizzled family receptors with their co-receptors, LRPs, uh, five and six, right? Um, and, you know, we've, we've leveraged Wnt in these differentiations, like I said, you use Wnt 3A or this small molecule glycogen synthase kinase GSK3 inhibitor that you love, Arun Shear. It's commonly used as a, as a surrogate for Wnt act, activation, but there's problems with that, right? Um, recombinant Wnt 3A, few people know this, but it's wall, water insoluble. You know, you can't use it in an aqueous condition. Um, so you can't just dump it into media. Therefore, you have to use this kind of serum stabilized Wnt 3A conditioned media if you want to have a Wnt activation or endogenous Wnt, or you use uh, shear, right? But that targets GSK3 beta, and that regulates diverse pathways. So there's a lot of off-target, undesired off-target effects with the shear. Um, so there is this unmet need for a, a way to just robustly activate uh, went just for practical terms, but also it's really important because you want to understand mechanistically how the wints work, right? What went activates, what receptor, and what are the downstream effects in what context? And because there's all this crosstalk and um, linkage between specific frizzled receptors and their downstream responses, you know, there's all these different uh, combinations that lead to different effects. Therefore, the the, the specific um, linkage of the of each uh, ligand with the receptor and effector it remains elusive um, because there's a lot of cross reactivity. So it's technically challenging to I identify the little sub subtypes of of wind pathway activation. So enter uh, K. Christopher Garcia again from Stanford. We got a lot of papers from Stanford University uh, on the show today. Well, they've been doing a lot of work to design. Uh, surrogates for this, okay, a way to really practically and effectively activate Wnt. And here they generate this uh, water-soluble frizzled subtype specific, they call it 
a, quote, next generation surrogate, these NGS wints, that heterodimerize frizzled with LRP6, okay? And these, this NGS wint, it supports long-term expansion of a whole slew of different types of uh, organoids, uh, hence Hans Clevers is on the paper. Um, we're about to get back to a little discussion of Hans Clevers, I feel, when we talk to Hannah Farine. Um, but they went with a whole slew of different type of organoids uh, and showed that they could cause organoid expansion, single, so single cell outgrowth. And using these NGS wins in vivo showed that you could um, get adult intestinal crypt proliferation. Um, and they show kind of mechanistically, they use it to try and, and this is probably what got into cell stem cells, as opposed to just being a tool, they then apply the tool to show that that adult intestinal crypt proliferation is uh, promoted by agonism of frizzled 5 and or frizzled 8, okay? Um, as opposed to a broad spectrum of frizzled receptors that can induce liver zonation, by contrast. So they're kind of alluding to how you can apply these NGS wins to see how in different systems, which specific frizzles are, are being applied uh, toward what effect. Um, so it's not just like a, a, a tool for just basic and everybody's laboratory kit to have like expansion of organoids or, or clonal, you know, proliferation, anything. Um, but also I think this is going to be a tool that's applied broadly uh, to, to, for mechanistic study. You know, I mean, one of the cells is that it's going to be you know, more practical. I, I don't know about that. I mean, this can't be cheap. That's got to be on the order of a common protein. So I don't think it's going to completely replace shear and the small molecule uh, agonists or inhibitors. But, you know, it's, it's another tool for the kit that's going to really allow high-resolution mechanistic study. Yeah, wind signaling is uh, stem cell biologist's best friend. And like you said, I'm a big fan of wind signaling. I use CHEER 99021 all the time. But CHEER is a pretty dirty small molecule. It, it'd be on the essence of being a small molecule. It's affecting a, a lot of different things, not necessarily just the wind signaling pathway. So with these NGS winds, you're really getting a fine-tuned, targeted approach into frizzle signaling and uh, specifically what's going on in the wind signaling pathway. Actually, a small note here, one of the authors on this paper is Sean Wu, and we talked about uh, a cheer mediated hyper expansion of cardiomyocytes a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they actually showed in the second figure of this particular paper that you can get that same hyperactivation and hyper proliferation of cardiomyocytes using these NGS WINT, not just with cheer. So that's showing that that hyper proliferation phenotype they actually saw in that cell stem cell paper a couple of weeks ago, it really is mediated by wind signaling. And you're not, it's not just a, a dirty off target that you're getting through the, through the cheer small molecule. So a cool um, progression, pro progression in the story there. But you're absolutely right. You know, if, if we could replace cheer 99021, I'd, I'd be pretty happy about that, right? But I don't think that's going to happen because this is a recombinant protein, and recombinant proteins are expensive. Cheer is pretty cheap. Small molecules are cheap. But hey, that's that's the economics of the thing. That's beyond my pay grade. But uh, uh, maybe down the road, we'll all be using these NGS wins for our differentiation protocols. Yes, for sure, for sure. I mean, I don't know about all of our protocols, but it depends on the application, right? Sometimes you just want to bang out a bunch of cardiomyocytes in your case, and you got to put the shear in there. Sometimes you're act looking for something a little more physiological, and which brings me to a message from Stem Cell. Looking to add more physiological relevance to your research? Intesticult Media provides a complete workflow for establishing, maintaining, and differentiating human intestinal organoids. Use Intesticult Organoid Growth Medium to establish and maintain organoids in a more proliferative state. Then, to achieve more physiologically relevant proportions of differentiated cell types for your experiments, passage your cultures in intesticult organoid differentiation medium. Receive an offer to try intesticult in your lab by visiting, visiting us online at www.stemcell.com slash try dash intesticult. All right, guys, today on the Stem Cell Podcast, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Henna Farin, who's junior research group leader at the York Spirehouse Institute for Tumor Biology and Experimental Therapy, also young investigator in the German Cancer Consortium. 
Dr. Farine's group uses organoids to study cell signaling in intestinal stem cells and colorectal cancer, and he's joined us today to talk about some of his research. Thank you so much, Hannah, for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me, and it's a great opportunity to be here, and a great pleasure to speak to you guys over the ocean. <laughs> well, the pleasure is all ours, Dr. Farine. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about intestinal organoids, which we've talked a little bit about on the podcast here, and they've become a pretty hot topic over the last few years, whether you're focusing on iPS-derived or primary human intestinal organoids. We actually had Hans Cleaver on the show a few weeks ago, who's, of course, one of the pioneers in the field. And so these stem cell-derived colon organoids are pretty advanced, and they have even the crypt villa structure that you normally find in the gut. So as an intentionally broad first question, how are these advanced intestinal organoid cultures revolutionizing our understanding of colon cancer, how it arises, and different ways to treat it? Yeah, so I think I would first really take a step back and uh, talk about the normal uh, adult stem cell-derived uh, um, organoids, and particularly the uh, intestinal and colonic uh, epithelial organoids because yeah the the uh, um, formulation of these conditions really allowed uh, to preserve these cells in their native state and to allow them to basically be responsive uh, to all kinds of biological uh, situations and to then uh, you know, execute differentiation programs that they could also uh, follow in vivo. Um, while this is, of course, a very simplistic and, uh, and ex vivo uh, um, system, um, I think the great advantage is that it is responsive and that it has different states, different choices, uh, and that, that it integrates uh, external cues, and that makes it, I think, uh, such a powerful system to have these non-transformed uh, expanding cultures. Yeah, I mean, there's so many applications uh, in just modeling generally and understanding the biology of the stem cells in the niche, and we'll get around to that. But, um, you know, those are near-term goals, I would say, this personalized approach with medicine with the primary cells. But a lot of the promise, you know, this is a stem cell podcast, I'm sorry if I'm pulling you a little bit out of your wheelhouse, but a lot of the promise of stem cells since early days has been related to the regenerative element. Um, and of course, there's like a cell-based element. You could inject cells that might contribute to regeneration. But many of the debil debilitating sequelae from uh, col colorectal cancer stem from the loss of tissue, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you have to resect the tumor, right? Um, and you hear about like bladders being made from autologous cells in, in limited scale. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the colon is obviously more dynamic, more complex tissue. Could you kind of walk us through what the obstacles are to generating a transplantable tissue uh, in the colon uh, to address kind of, you know, that issue of loss of tissue to cancer? Yeah, I think this is multifactorial. So generating uh, just just using these uh, epithelial organoids and perfusing them in a wounded tissue, for example, is most likely not going to help to uh, to regenerate uh, uh, major uh, insults because often these are then associated with uh, fibrosis, scarring uh, processes, and you know, basically the space is lost where these, these cells could uh, then... Uh, execute that program and uh, uh, regenerate a new layer. So there I think we really have to think about all the other tissue layers. And uh, if we are talking about really um, um, reconstructing uh, pieces of, of the gut, I think there are, I think the most promising uh, results are really from the IPS uh, derived uh, uh, um, cells um, um, intestinal uh, organoids that comprises uh, tissue uh, complexity. So I think that may uh, may be interesting because reawakening this embryonic program 
uh, during this regenerative uh, period may actually be very beneficial. Um, I do not want to exclude that adult stem cell uh, also will play a major role in future in uh, regenerative. Uh, uh, but this may, may be a bit more, I think, more you know, like genetic uh, um, defects that only cover specific compartments um, or that may actually not uh, cover um, large uh, tissues like the intestine where re replenishing the anti-epithelium is obviously a big challenge but rather smaller epithelial uh, tissues like salivary, salivary glands. I think there it may be actually already curative for people that have lack of these glands uh, to, to again have functional salivary gland, uh, uh, sal uh, salivary uh, production by just implanting pretty small rudiments of, of these adult stem cell derived uh, tissues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, moreover, of course, the, uh, the uh, enzyme, enzyme complementation uh, therapies there, I think it may actually not be necessary to reconstruct a whole organ, but just to provide back a certain percentage of cells. And uh, there, I think, then having access to adult stem cell-derived uh, tissue that is already very close to the real thing, Maybe uh, maybe very beneficial in uh, comparison to um, the uh, IPS uh, solutions that still I think have this uh, final uh, that lacks this final steps of maturity and um, yeah mm. yeah whether you're using these tissues for regenerative medicine or for disease modeling you know in vitro modeling they're still exceptionally powerful for these applications and you mentioned the ips applications for some tissue types like the gut it seems like researchers like yourself have the luxury of using either ips or primary gut tissues to make these organoids i know other tissues like the lung also have this dual advantage of being able to generate organoids from either ipsc or primary tissues yeah. so both types of organoids can be patient specific and they can be used for personalized medicine but ultimately what drives that decision to use either ips or primary intestinal organoids or is it okay to use them interchangeably now, let me first of all comment on, on this, because this has long, uh, many years, these have been separate uh, scientific disciplines. And I think this organoid technology is really bringing, uh, bringing together these different uh, disciplines. And um, because we ultimately we are all using the same adult cultural conditions, and uh, but it creates such more possibilities yeah, for be it uh, gene, genetic engineering where uh, the adult stem cells may still uh, contain uh, quite a bottleneck to, uh, for homologous uh, recombination, for example. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think there this, uh, this makes uh, the, the current research, I think, extremely vivid and uh, fluid. Uh, between the between the disciplines, and I've I've seen great examples how actually um, this can uh, complement each other, and um, you know, and it's really growing towards one uh, stem cell community. Uh, so I think which uh, model is um, is more relevant is is really uh, has to be uh, decided on a case by case, and I, I think it may actually even be good to tackle things from different aspects um, um, because um, obviously the uh, um, having the access to um, genetically defined and highly characterized uh, IPS lines that uh, uh, um, basically can um, eliminate a big um, um, big genetic um, heterogeneity that is introduced by using the adult stem cell derived um, uh, tissues. And I think there, um, yeah, there are many, many pros and cons for these. 
So let's talk about just a specific application. You know, one aspect of primary organoids that makes them so useful and precious is the ability to model cancer treatments. And you exploited this recently to evaluate the off-target cytotoxicity of these variable CAR strategies, chimeric antigen receptor strategies in this EMBO article. So this, to my understanding, um, which is relatively rudimentary compared to yours, was focused more on, on assessing whether frizzled was a, an appropriate target for a subgroup of, of colorectal cancer tumors, right? So, you know, a group of tumors. Uh, but do you ultimately envision, just, you know, in talking about the horizons of this work, do you ultimately envision that this or a similar screening approach would be applied to looking at, like, in the same patient, you take the tumor versus normal colonic organoids within that individual patient and screen to look for new or existing, you know, CAR or, or associated type therapies? Are we talking about, you know, getting this down to this single patient resolution or do you think that that really is either unnecessary or impractical? Yeah, I think this um, may be uh, really uh, an important um, advantage to have the patient-specific normal control. Um, whether this will be always uh, required, I think, depends on the type of therapy that we are looking at. Um, I think um, if uh, these are... Um, for example, drug uh, um, uh, pharmacologic uh, therapies and uh, having a, a large cohort of normals um, would perhaps be good enough to uh, to estimate a therapeutic window that that would be then um, relevant for a certain uh, certain patient. But um, if these are highly individualized approaches, um, perhaps even using um, yeah, CAR T cells that are generated uh, in a patient-specific uh, fashion, then uh, um, this could could be could become important to um, to have this control. And um, mm. yeah, so in that setting, I think. It is really important to look at um, yeah, um, how populations are pop different uh, of different uh, tumors, different uh, patients respond to a certain uh, therapy. I don't think that it may always be necessary to to uh, to have this normal tumor uh, uh, this paired con uh, control in each case to uh, to have an added value here. Hmm. So speaking of this, uh, some of your recent work, in addition to this CAR work, your lab also published a paper recently in Cell Stem Cell that we actually briefly covered here on the podcast. And this is focusing on using a pooled CRISPR screen in human colon organoids to identify tumor drivers and oncogenes as well. You actually combined it with a mouse model to validate tumor suppressor function. So CRISPR screening, screening has become a pretty powerful approach in both forward and reverse genetics over the last five years or so. Um, it's you know partly because of some of the advances coming out of the Broad Institute, for example. So you can throw a massive pool of CRISPR guide RNAs at the genome to figure out how a particular disease phenotype arises. So talk a little bit about this cell stem cell work and what you found and how CRISPR screens are advancing our advan advancing our understanding of tumor biology. Yeah, so this was, I think, starting from a really uh, technical um, interest to um, to adopt this, uh, this, uh, this technology now in, uh, in patient-derived uh, or in human 3D uh, cells. Uh, which had so far not been done. So this was, uh, from the beginning, it was quite clear to us that this would be very challenging because we have an understanding about um, yeah, the amount of um, colonies that we can achieve in this, uh, in this confined matrigal space that, uh, that, uh, that we seed our cells out. And um, then... Basically, we um, try to identify questions where we could use a focused library to um, to 
um, uses technology to really push the borders and uh, um, get an uh, yeah ex ability to look at tumor suppressors in an unbiased fashion. Um, for for that purpose, uh, we uh, constructed a uh, roughly 2,000 guide library and uh, then um, transplanted uh, these uh, organoids uh, back into um, immunocompromised mice uh, to uh, identify uh, tumor suppressors that would basically in this um, seno, uh, transportation scenario um, allow um, tumorigenic growth. And um, yeah, so in a way we scored here for a, uh, a very complex uh, uh, selection uh, scenario, which is um, uh, the um, um, growth of uh, of uh, 3D organoids under the skin of, of these new mice. So under the influence of um, of uh, growth factors of, um, of stromal cells of um, um, ECM of this uh, of this mouse and to to study which would be the breaks that in a human cell uh, uh, when relieved uh, uh, allowed in such a 3D environment uh, to to grow. So I think uh, this was a, uh, um, a feasible um, scenario uh, to study such a we call it um, um, rescue uh, screen. Um, but we actually have done this with the intent to um, um, to further develop this now and to, um, uh, into into um, screening scenarios that will also allow us to study uh, not not rescue scenarios but survival scenarios. Uh, uh, so, sorry, um, uh, vulnerabilities uh, where we uh, basically then uh, would have the possibility to um, um, investigate. Uh, Tumor specific, um, yeah, um, weak weaknesses that we could um, identify with a, such a pooled screening um, approach. Mm. So yeah, I don't. Maybe this is in the same vein and a bit redundant, but you know, a big aspect of organoid biology is it's a closer approximation of like the physiological standard, right? The three D, and a big part of that also is the niche. Um, and in organ regeneration and cancer, we often focus on the, the intrinsic uh, operator, right? The stem cell that's driving growth, the cell that's growing. But of course, we all know that that stem cell growth is almost invariably dependent on the niche. How, how are you leveraging beyond? I mean, you kind of just elaborated a bit on it. But um, is there any more you can tell us on how you're leveraging organoids and the other research tools in the lab to really dissect the contribution of the niche? in supporting the colorectal uh, cancer stem cell? Yeah, of course, our laboratory is really uh, interested in how in a tumor scenario, um, the uh, stromal signals basically um, affect the tumor uh, phenotype. And I think uh, in the uh, past years, we uh, have really learned that uh, particularly for colon cancer, but also other uh, solid cancers, the um, the main predictor of, of a tumor is really um, its um, entire uh, microenvironment. So this is by uh, for colon cancer by far more um, predictive um, uh, than uh, than the, for example the tumor mutational spectrum. Uh, to look basically at what the composition of a certain tumor uh, is um, built of. So this we usually uh, can uh, deduce from uh, transcriptomic data uh, and the transcriptomic subtyping in, uh, in tumors is uh, basically uh, reflecting um, this uh, specific um, composition of the tumor microenvironment. And um, this has a lot of similarities to uh, to actually the uh, the processes during uh, embryogenesis, uh, during normal uh, stem cell homeostasis um, um, processes that actually have uh, followed me during my um, my scientific uh, uh, path so far. And uh, one one of the 
particular aspect that I always found interesting was the uh, the uh, epithelial mesenchymal interactions, um, and um, interestingly enough, this is uh, also in colon cancer. This uh, presence of this mesenchymal stroma is really uh, the most um, characterizes the most um, um, yeah, dismal um, prognosis, mm. and uh, this is uh, I think we are learning in the uh, past years really um, due to uh, several effects. So there are direct interactions uh, between these mesenchymal cells and the tumor cells that uh, foster uh, th uh, their uh, invasiveness and, and their malignancy traits. But now we uh, also are understanding that uh, the immune uh, system plays a very important role in this, uh, in this uh, epithelial mesenchymal Signaling, which basically induces that these uh, these um, fibroblast-rich tumors are often escaping uh, the um, patient's um, um, immune response um, against uh, against uh, uh, tumors. Mm -hmm. So, within this context, I think we are we're really interested in how these these different cell interactions are initiated. Uh, and what they actually uh, have, uh, what type of direct consequences they have, and um, um, we we are using these uh, these uh, um, co-culture systems to basically, in a stepwise manner, try to uh, to reconstruct these um, these interactions. Yes, well, there's so many different questions that we still have to answer when it comes to basic tumor biology, and you're at an amazing place to, to help answer some of those questions. You're at the Georg Speyerhaus Institute for Tumor Biology and Experimental Therapy in Frankfurt, Germany, which is, of course, a pretty storied research institute with a history dating back over 100 years. I believe its mm -hmm. first director was Nobel laureate Paul Ehrlich, I believe, uh, who's actually That's a true. pioneer. He's, he's really a pioneer in modern chemotherapy, one of the fathers of chemotherapy and he actually helped also find the cure for syphilis, too. Um, so the Institute's been focusing on chemotherapy and cancer research since the early 1900s, right? Um, so for those of us outside of Germany who might not be as familiar with the Institute, tell us a little bit more about it. What drew you there and what do you love about working there? Yeah, as you say, this is, is, is historical um, institute and uh, the spirit is in the, in the corridors here. Um, it's actually a, a very uh, attractive environment to uh, to work uh, because of this uh, old uh, architecture we have here. Oh, there's a lot of space. Uh, this is a big contrast to other research institutes that I've been working in. This <laughs> more modern type. So. Um, but I think the the great inspiration that is also transported by this history is is also in, very interesting and uh, um it was now i think 8 years ago that uh with the change of directorship here um the institute really moved uh from a more broad chemotherapy to cancer biology and uh, tumor microenvironment in particular this was driven by uh, by Florian Greten, the, uh, the director at, of the institute, and uh, yeah, he recruited a number of uh, uh, young uh, um, um, investigators from different disciplines to cover this microenvironmental uh, interaction, and that makes it actually interesting to work here because uh, we study often very similar processes on different organs, and uh, there's. Uh, yeah, a lot of exchange and uh, technologies and uh, interesting collaborations that are facilitated. Uh, yeah, like like for example this car uh, um, project that we started with uh, with Winfried Wells, who has uh, this this uh, uh, this uh, uh, expertise in car biology and where it was really a great match to then. Um, um, conceptualizes project uh, with them together. Um, yeah, but we are embedded here at the uh, at the medical, close to the medical university, and uh, yeah, this is also I think a very um, yeah lively uh, campus. Uh, we uh, have now 
recently uh, funded the uh, or founded the uh, Frankfurt Cancer Institute, which is um, now basically setting the stage for uh, for cancer research here uh, in the uh, Rhein-Main area. And um, yeah, this is an, these are um, exciting developments. So that's a bit about where you're at, uh, but uh, we got to hear a little bit about where you're from. You know, Arun mentioned that we had Hans Cleavers on the on the show and his, on the outset of the interview, and of course, you contributed to his massive imprint in on the field while you were a postdoc there. One takeaway I had from our interview with him was that he had a bit of an unconventional view on the relationship between hypothesis and observation. Uh, that I won't elaborate on. Everybody, you can go and check out the interview. Um, but every research, and even every research inquiry, I'll say, has its own little nuance to it. Um, so I don't want to pigeonhole you as like a Hans Kleber's acolyte, right? But do you think there are any aspects of your lab's culture that you carried with you from the Kleber's lab? If so, I mean, would you elaborate on those? Because, I mean, I just have this theory that it, it doesn't always play that way. You know, there's this idea of uh, scientific pedigree. And he's such a unique character, I think, in science that, you know, it would be, it would be more obvious, I think, if all, uh, if all his acolytes or all the, the descendants of his lab had those same character attributes. But I'd be guessing that that's not necessarily the case. Let me know, Hannah. What do you think? Do you think that you carry with you a bit of the, the Clever's... Uh, scientific philosophy well i hope so yeah, because this was of course a <laughs> yeah a fantastic opportunity to be uh, in in such a, a lab with uh, with um yeah other poster colleagues that uh, um yeah had uh, had this uh, amazing um yeah broads in uh, in knowledge on different fields different backgrounds and um yeah, visionary uh, um, ideas uh, that that were pursued or observations that were stumbled upon. So this was, uh, I think, uh, the uh, um, every uh, person's individual um, um, way uh, to uh, to uh, to to take advantage of this uh, fantastic environment that Hans is basically creating there in this uh, in the Hübrecht Institute. So I think that is something that I certainly also try to um, try to um, build up here as a junior PI to create such a space where um, where people have the possibility to um, yeah to. Uh, pursue uh, uh, research and uh, yeah, be a facilitator in that aspect. Um, but of course, I. Um, but that, that's something that it's hard to learn to have this. Yeah, this uh, uh, visionary um, uh, perspective on uh, and and this instinct basically on. Um, on uh, questions that that are worthwhile uh, mm. um, um, getting uh, yeah, interest on, and uh, is, is for me still I think very 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 tough because I am uh, and Hans has uh, often mentioned that uh, I'm much more interested in detail and in mm. uh, in um, yeah uh, in, in diving deep into 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 a certain biology rather than uh stepping back and uh and uh, and have more the uh, um yeah um predator type of <laughs> um <laughs> you were... yeah well you do you henner i think you're doing just fine <laughs> yeah you're doing it your way and you're still carrying forward Dr. Cleaver's legacy and you're creating your own legacy along the way. So thank you so much for joining us here today, Dr. Farine. And before we let you go, we're going to ask you one little non-scientific question, or, you know, it can be a scientific question if you'd like it to be. What was your greatest moment in science? It doesn't necessarily have to be in the context of science, but did you have a scientific revelation or a surprise in Dr. Cleaver's lab, for example, that was really transformative in your particular life or in your scientific career? So what was that? And uh, tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, no, I think uh, 
as a researcher, once when one has to appreciate all these small uh, revelations, all these small moments where you make an observation uh, that uh, makes you understand things better, um, even if they may just be very small uh, pieces of the puzzle. Yeah? But I think the the most important uh, um, surprise moment was um, perhaps uh, um, more the uh, are the, the microscopic uh, visualization of uh, of, uh, of biology that that because I think that is uh, so much more illustrative than uh, than other types of um, of, uh, of of data. So I think yeah, this was I think after massive uh, cloning and uh, mouse generation and. Uh, spending a lot of hours in the uh, basement in the microscope room to basically then see uh, the uh, Win3 uh, um, distribution and in the uh, intestinal epithelium on uh, on these membranes. I think that was something that really uh, was uh, such, such a moment. Um, and yeah, I think we, I think my, it's, I'm still very much, uh, uh, torn towards this uh, microscopical uh, um, um, investigation, and now we, we try to kind of trans transform or uh, transform the same type of um, things into into different um, uh, dimensions as well. Because I think it, it, it's uh, I'm now developing uh, really uh, we're doing more and more. Um, uh, next generation sequencing or multi-omics approaches, and I think one can uh, one can have a similar uh, revelation moments there as well. So I think this is, uh, um, is perhaps my take on this question. Yeah, I think that it's a common uh, theme to see something right for the first time, to see something that you thought was true. And then to see the verification of that is uh, it's a big deal. And as we move forward, as you're alluding to our ability to both, you know, manipulate and then resolve these uh, truths uh, microscopically. I'm with you. I love to look down the microscope and see the truth. Uh, it's getting more and more refined. And so you're setting the stage for a lot of young trainees and investigators to see their aha moments for the first time. So kudos to you for paying it forward. And thanks again for joining us for this interview. This has been a really fun chat and we hope to have you on again. Thank you. All right, you guys, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter, at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. And hey, guys, apply for this new podcast we're putting out, the sister podcast. It's about immunology. If you have an interest, come on, make an application. Let your voice be heard. Share with us and also come back in a couple weeks for the next episode. Okay, guys, thanks for joining us. Goodbye. Goodbye.